Before we start this week's presentation, I'd first like to welcome everyone back to the channel and hope you all had a very happy new year. But now, without any more delays, because we all know I've caused quite a few recently, we will begin. Of the presentations I have done of the numerous murders that have occurred in the region over the centuries, one common underlying theme that seems to spring up time and time again is that of a deeply unhappy or troubled relationship between two parties, often married couples. And the one I have for you today is no different. A seemingly happily married couple who under the surface was anything but. In 1807, the town of Attleborough in Norfolk was a reasonably sized market town, having a population of 1,333 in the 1801 census. As it was in every town of this kind across the country, locals worked hard, either in the town itself or on the surrounding farms, and their downtime was often spent in whichever pub was local to them. And it would be in one of these pubs that our couple in question were last seen together. It was the 18th of July, 1807, a Saturday, and the White Horse on London Street was a hive of activity, busy with locals and regulars. What topics of conversation were going on among its patrons have long since been lost to history, but we can take educated guesses. For many, it was probably topics of work, local goings-on and gossip while the little more worldly and educated were probably talking about the international affairs of the time, the ongoing war with Napoleon, the death of Henry Benedict Stuart, the last Stuart claimant to the throne of England, and with his death marked the end of the Jacobite movement, or the more pressing Chesapeake Leopard affair that had just happened, an attack by the Royal Navy on a ship of the newly independent United States while looking for deserters from the Royal Navy that had left four US sailors dead and looked like it might drag the two nations back into war once again. Among all this sat a married couple, Samuel and Martha Alden. They had arrived shortly after the white horse had opened, and were currently at the bar talking, while others entered. Among them was a man named Edmund Draper, a neighbour who joined the couple, and after a few moments of general pleasantries, Martha announced to Edmund and her husband that she had to go, wanting to return home to check on their child. Now alone, the two men left the bar, heading deeper into the pub, where they settled down on a couple of chairs for a catch-up, and it would be here they would spend the next couple of hours, before leaving themselves, both heading off in the same direction, Edmund acting as a kind of escort for Samuel, who seemed to be slightly worse for wear for drink, with it being believed he had been drinking long before the pub had opened that day, with it being believed this was either possibly the cause or an effect of a morning argument with Martha and an ongoing symptom of their worsening relationship, and the reason she had left so abruptly. As they set out heading home in the direction of Thetford, they bumped into Martha again, this time with her seven-year-old son. The four would walk together before reaching the Olden household, where Edmund made his farewells and carried on towards his own home. Little did he know he would never see his good friend again. Little would seem off to anyone in the town for the rest of the day, or into the night not until the very early hours of Sunday the 19th. Charles Hill was on his way to visit his daughter, who worked as a maid in Shelfhanger Hall some ten miles away. Wishing to get there early and possibly attend church together, he had set out before sunrise, passing the Alden's cottage at some point between 2 and 3 a.m., where he was met by a very unusual sight. The door of the cottage stood open, and out in front of the house stood Martha. Upon locking eyes with each other, Martha spoke first, saying, Could not think what smart young man it was who was coming down the common. Charles ignored the slightly strange compliment given the situation, and replied with, Martha, what the devil are you up to at this time of the morning? Her story of excuses ran from the plausible to the strange. First she said she had got up to fetch some water from a well across the road. Then it changed to her just getting home, having gone to collect her husband from the pub. As the back and forth went on, she suddenly announced her husband was going away for a while to visit a brother in Essex. Something that shocked Charles Hill, as Samuel had promised to work for him in the upcoming harvest, and his rash decision to leave would now leave him short a man. He asked her if she was sure that he was going to be gone for that long, to which she answered, If he go to Essex, he won't come back to harvest. I know he will never come back. And if he has got a job, he never will settle to it. With little more to say to each other, Hill carried on to visit his daughter, thinking little of the strange interaction until much later, his mind now more likely on where he was going to find an extra man to help him when harvest came. 
The next unsuspecting and for the moment innocent party to enter this tale was a woman named Mary Orvintz, a good friend of Martha, who, while going about her daily routine that Sunday, suddenly heard a knocking at her door. Going to see who it was, she found Martha, who was very insistent that Mary follow her back to her home right away. Mary agreed somewhat reluctantly and followed Martha to her cottage. Stepping inside, all seemed normal until the door was closed behind her and Martha rather abruptly announced, I have killed my husband, before leading her through to the bedroom. And there they found Samuel, still clothed, laying on the bed, covered in blood. His head had almost been totally severed and his face and head were covered in wounds, made by the murder weapon, a billhook, a kind of knife used in agriculture for cutting and chopping, that lay on the floor a little way from the body. For Mary, she was now at a crossroads moment of her life, where she could either choose between her friend and reporting a murder. Maybe out of loyalty, maybe out of fear, as she was now alone in the home with a murderer, or maybe she knew more about the relationship than we do, but she chose the former helping Martha to move the body from the bed in a corn sack and drag it from the house and to a small detached garden the Aldens owned where they had their well and dumping it into a ditch. Mary was now an accessory to murder. The pair would split up to not arouse suspicion, meeting up again the following night after the sun had set to move the sack from the ditch to a waterlogged hole that had since been dug on the local common where the body was removed from the sack and hidden. The next step for the duo was to clean the bedroom where the killing had taken place which they did on the morning of the 21st. The bed sheets were washed thoroughly and the walls and floors were scrubbed until spotless, removing all evidence of the dreadful crime that had taken place. The blade of the billhook was cleaned thoroughly, or so they thought. When all was said and done, Martha reminded her friend not to say a word about the matter, or if she did, she would certainly be hanged. Mary had probably already realised this and promised to keep quiet about what had happened and her part in the whole thing although she did later confess to her father what had happened. But if Mary had kept her mouth shut or not, this would turn out to be largely irrelevant. The final hiding place for the body turned out not to be as secret as Martha had hoped, and it had subsequently been found. Authorities were alerted, and Attleborough being such a small place, it did not take long to be discovered that it was Samuel, a man who no one had seen in the past few days, and now investigations began. A local constable, Edward Rush, was sent to the Alden's cottage to search the property. And it was here that things began to fall down, both for Martha and Mary. As he looked around, he found a billhook. Normally, he may have overlooked it as a common household item in the country at the time, but this one was seemingly being hidden in a badly lit corner of the room, as if it was meant to be ignored. Upon inspecting it closely, Rush noticed there was blood gathered around the top of the handle, Clearly, it had not been washed as well as Martha thought it had been. Martha was promptly arrested and held until her trial at the Norfolk Assizes in Shire Hall in Norwich on the 27th of July, 1807, overseen by Judge Sir Nash Gross for the willful murder of her husband, Samuel Alden of Attleborough, Norfolk. The prosecution put forward the argument that Martha had attacked her husband while he slept off the effects of the drink hitting him with the billhook in the face, head and neck until she killed him, before, with the aid of Mary, who by now had also been arrested, disposed of the body. Martha made no defence for her actions. Next, witness after witness were called forward, telling their stories of that fateful day. The first was Edmund Draper, who told of the time in the pub and the walk back with Samuel, saying that his friend had been in good health, if not slightly worse for drink, when he had parted with him on the 18th and that during his time with the couple, there had been no real sign of argument or problem between them. After Edmund came a woman named Sarah Leader, who unknowingly had helped in hiding the body, as well as being the person who had discovered it. She ended our tale on the night of the 20th, when Martha appeared at her door asking to borrow a spade. Hers had broken while digging up potatoes, or so she claimed. Like a good neighbour, Sarah agreed and gave her hers, thinking little of it. Her next involvement came 24 hours later. Some of the ducks Sarah owned had gone missing when she came to shut them in their pen for the night. So she went looking for them, thinking they were probably on the common. While there, she came upon a newly dug, water-filled hole with something floating in it. But the night was too dark to be able to see what it was. After finding her ducks, she thought she would come back and investigate in better conditions. 
and she would return in the light of the morning to look again. And after some poking with a stick, this strange mass in the water revealed a pair of hands and blood-covered clothes. Samuel had been found. A local paper covered the discovery. Chu, the witness, instantly concluded that a murdered man had been thrown in there, and called to a lad to go and acquaint the neighbourhood with the circumstances, and went back in great alarm to her own house. In a quarter of an hour she returned again to the pond, and found that in her absence the body had been taken out. She then knew it to be the body of Samuel Alden. His face was dreadfully chopped, and his head cut very nearly off. The body was put in a cart and carried to the house of the deceased. The witness afterwards went to look for her spade, and found it standing by the side of the hole, which she described as looking like a grave, dug in the ditch which surrounded Alden's garden. She further stated that this hole was open, not very deep, and she saw blood lying near it. Edward Rush told of his search of the house and the discovery of the murder weapon, but it was the next witness called forward that would be the final nail in the coffin for Martha. It was none other than Mary, called as a principal witness who was more than willing to cooperate in order to save herself from the end of a rope, and she dutifully told the court everything that happened in damning detail. It didn't take long for Martha to be pronounced guilty of her husband's murder and sentenced to death by hanging, and afterwards her body to be dissected, cut open and examined by doctors in the growing field of medical science, and the use of condemned prisoners for this was a way to keep the body snatchers out of graveyards. Upon hearing her sentence, Martha broke down, confessing that she had long planned to kill Samuel due to his neglect of her, spending so much of their money in the white horse, and that during an earlier argument he had threatened to beat her if she tried to stop him. She also made it clear that Mary had nothing to do with the killing itself, and although she had helped move the body, she should be considered wholly innocent and freed of all charges. From what I have been able to find, the court would listen to this final plea, and Mary would be let off. But Martha was not so lucky. She met her fate on the 31st of July, 1807, at 12 noon. She was taken by horse and cart to Castle Hill in Norwich, where she was promptly hanged. When the news of her death reached Attleborough, a group of angry locals, feeling justice had not been done enough to their standards, descended on her cottage and destroyed the building. For those inclined to believe in the paranormal, the ghost of Mary Alden is said to still haunt the castle first being seen on the mound shortly after her death, and is now said to mostly haunt the galleries of the museum that is now housed in the castle. Who knows, maybe she spends her time talking to Robert Goodale, who is also said to haunt the castle after being hanged for the murder of his wife, also with a billhook some sixty years later. And with this ends another story of tragedy from the county of Norfolk, and the first of our videos carrying us through 2022. I hope to have a lot more content for you coming up this year of all various kinds. If you've seen the update video, you'll know of the things going on in the first couple of months, but once that's sorted, we should be on track again. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. All of the information and pictures used can be found in the description below. Please feel free to like and subscribe if you wish. This was Mary Alden, the Attleborough murderer, and this was A Little Bit of History.